All right. There's this one thing about microphones. They have to be on to work. Um, welcome to this event. Are you glad that you are here? Yes. Grab your Bible. Is there joy in the house of the Lord this evening? I have missed being with you for three weeks because I love you. Because, because you love God and the Bible, and I love being with the saints. Like it says in 1 John, is there not an increasing sense of joy being with the people of God? Um, I, didn't, I didn't understand that for a long time, and I do now, and I'm thankful for that. I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. Grab your Bible. Who's got their Bible? Show me your Bible. Phone's fine. I'm not like one of those boomers who's like, that's bad. Um, it's the same, same content. Everyone's like, oh, it's on your phone. It's more distracting. I'm like, we had comic book Bibles growing up, man. That is way more distracting. We used to draw flip books in our Bible, which I'm not even genuinely sure if that's a sin or not. All I know is that we did it. Um, <laughs> we're talking about Proverbs. We're talking about 10 Proverbs tonight on parenting and family. If you're new to this event, this is a verse-by-verse -verse study of the Bible the Bible was meant to be studied verse by verse because God wrote it verse by verse. That's why we do it that way. With the book of Proverbs, we are doing it a bit differently because uh, Proverbs has repeat thoughts all throughout it, and it would be laborious to study through chapters 10 through 29 because they are cyclical in their theme. I hope that you do study it word by word all the way through in your own time. And we've given a free Bible study book to anyone who wants one. And there's digital copies, too, if you're watching online, for you to study all the way through. But I thought the best way to teach this content would be to grab the themes and teach through top 10. So we've done work. We've done what? Money. Did we do that one? Yes, we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we are now going to do parenting and family. But before we do that, I want to talk about this idea of a scansion, which is a an idea that is in English. I just can't get the stuff in the right spot. Just give me a sec. Oh. I want to talk about this idea of a scansion in Hebrew poetry. A scansion is something in English that is, um, well, let me just explain it in, in, in this way. Uh, it's a noun, um, and it means uh, the determined pattern of a rhyme or phrase. And it's typically used in American poetry, and that's like the kind of idea that you can look up. And in Hebrew poetry, we would call that a pattern. And you don't have to understand Hebrew poetry to understand the book of Proverbs, and you don't have to understand Hebrew poetry to understand the book of Psalms, but it helps. It helps because it's cool and because it's interesting and because it was written with these ideas in mind. In the same way, if you were writing a limerick and uh, you were writing a limerick in, in English or if you were writing a haiku, do you guys know what a haiku is? It's a poem that has five, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Yeah, it's got fat syllables is the word. We're not off to a great start. You got five syllables in the first line, seven in the second line, and five in the third line. That's, it's a Japanese type of poetry. Now, you could translate that to English, and you would get the sense of it, but it might not sound the same because the English word might not have the same amount of syllables. Does that make sense? And so you don't have to understand Japanese to understand what the person was saying, but if you understand what a haiku is, it can help you understand what they're saying in addition to the English words. Does that make sense? And so that's why we're studying this. So I want to talk about different types of um, patterns in Hebrew poetry, specifically in the book of Proverbs. And I genuinely hope that this will help you. Grab, uh, take some notes. This might help you a little bit. These are the amount of lines that are used in this type of proverb. So the first one is called a monocolon, which is a short, simple phrase, which just means it's a proverb that is one line. Have you noticed how there are proverbs that are like one line, there's ones that seem kind of like couplets, there's ones that have like repeating, and then there's a couple in there that have like a bunch of lines, it's like a paragraph, have you noticed that? That is a facet of Hebrew poetry that I would like to briefly teach you right now. 
Uh, an example of a monocolon is Proverbs 24, 26, which says, an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. Um, an example from, uh, not from the Bible, but from ancient literature, because these are ancient literature ideas as well. Scatter not your sheep in untried grazing. That's, that's the similar idea. And Christians have an issue with stuff like this because they have an issue with the fact that there are flood accounts from other cultures other than Christianity, and it really bothers Christians so much, and they act like that's not true. And I don't know why that is, because the flood happened, and the flood narrative suggests that not everyone out of the flood followed God. So wouldn't you tell your kids and grandkids that that happened? And if you didn't believe in God, wouldn't you not say that God did it, because that isn't what you believed? Does that make sense? Am I losing you here? No? No one's responding in any way. No one's reacting. I can see your faces. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, man. Oof. Um, a bicolon is a couplet. This is the most common example, and I've got a few different examples of this. Um, it is a couplet, like if A is true, then B is true also, is an example of one way that you could have it. All of them are not like that, and I'm going to give you an example of each. Um, the first type is a parallelism. An example is in Proverbs 19.5. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who pours out lies will not go free. So the idea, the couplet there, is the will not go, and it's bringing in ideas uh, that are similar but not the same. It's a, it's a literary style, and it is 100% true, and the Holy Spirit inspired it, but it is also a common style from the time. Another type of bicolon, which is a couplet, is a progression, like Proverbs 17, 8, which says, a bribe is a charm to the one who gives it. Wherever he turns, he succeeds. Now, the Bible isn't saying that a bribe is a good thing, so don't pull out Proverbs 17, 8 the next time you get pulled over. The Bible is saying that it works. Does that make sense? That's actually a really important thing when you're studying the Bible. Just because the Bible says it doesn't mean you're supposed to do it. It says in the Bible that Judas went out and hanged himself. That doesn't mean that's a thing that you're supposed to do. It means that's a thing that happened. Does that make sense? Okay. Another example of a bicolon or a couplet is an admonition. By the way, I learned this from a commentator named Dwayne Garrett. So most of this is, is very closely adapted from what he taught me through his book. Um, an admonition, like Proverbs 20, 18, make plans by seeking advice. If you wage war, obtain guidance. Um, I'm, I'm genuinely gonna refrain from Russia, Ukraine jokes because it's not a funny thing. Even though they'd be very easy, it's a horrific thing and, and a lot of innocent people are dying. Um, and it would have been a really easy joke, but I just, yes, for once, God helped me not do that. Um, that's an example of an admonition by colon. Here's another one, a marismus, like in Proverbs 15, 9, which says, the Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. So the idea of a parallelism is the ideas are parallel. And we've talked about that a lot. Who was here when we studied the book of Joel? We talked about synonymous parallelisms. We also talked about that when we studied the book of Psalms. Um, progression is uh, explaining with the second line what happens in the first line. And um, here we have a marismus, which is a, uh, from a different perspective or from the opposite perspective or looking at that in a different way. Does that make sense? So it's a couplet of an idea. It's like an idea rhyme, similar to a parallelism. And then they just continue. So these are all two-line proverbs. Then we have three-line proverbs. It was just called a tricolon. And these can be um, explained in different ways with this, this little math that's at the beginning of all three of these, which explains the format of, oh, that's big. It's like highlighter level. What? Okay, take that off, back, back, boom. Just like grace, you get a second chance. All right. So all of these tricolons have three lines, but they'll be expressed in the way that the lines relate to each other. So here you see, do you see a man skilled in his work? He'll serve before kings. He won't serve before obscure men. So you see why it's a one plus two tricolon because the first line is saying, here's a thing. And the second two are mirroring each other by saying, here's a thing he will do and here's a thing he will 
not do. Then here, a two plus one, and this is an example not from the biblical, biblical text. Except that death is humiliating for us, except that life is exalting for us, the house of death is for life. Can't go back to that church cornerstone. Pastor quotes from books other than the Bible. He was quoting pagan work tonight. So th that's that idea there, pretty simple. And then here's a one plus one plus one, um, Proverbs 25, 13. Like the coolness of snow at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the spirit of his masters. So you see how, you, I'm sure you just get it. I don't need to explain it anymore. You guys are smart, you get it. And then we have a quatrain, quatrain which I don't know how to say because I've only ever read it in a book. That was the first time I ever said it out loud. Do not control. <laughs> um, oh, here he goes again. Pastor's just quoting pagan literature. Doesn't even know how to say a theological term. <laughs> don't control your wife in her house. When you know she is efficient, don't say to her, where is it? Get it when she's put it in the right place. So this is an idea of a quatrain, and this is also sounds like the premise of like every awful situational marriage comedy from the last 30 years. Am I right? I, I can't stand, do you guys watch those shows? I can't stand those shows. I was with my grandpa one time and he was watching one of those. What's the, um, what's the one with Ray Romano in it? It was a whole episode about they were arguing about who was gonna put away the uh, suitcase when they came home from a vacation. And I was like, this isn't funny at all. This just sounds sad. It sounds miserable the whole time. These ideas have, <laughs> these ideas have been around forever. There is an example of one, because that's not in the text. Then here is an example of one that is in the text, and this is an AABB. I know this might be a lot, but I wanna, I wanna bless you guys with this. This really helps understand what is going on in these Proverbs. A wise man has great power, and a man of knowledge increases strength. For waging war, you need guidance, and for victory, many ideas. So you see how it's an AABB based on what the type of idea is that it's going for. Here's another example, A, B, A, C. The sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. All day long he craves for more, but the righteous give without sparing. So you see here it's an A, B, A, C because the first and third lines rhyme in their ideas and the fourth line is, is adding an additional piece to it. Does that make sense? And it continues. There's even a pentad, which is a rare one. We see this in Proverbs chapter 30, which we're gonna study verse by verse in a few weeks, which I'm very excited about because it has some of the weirdest Proverbs that are the least quoted. Here it says, there are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough, the grave, the barren womb, land, which is never satisfied with water, and fire, which never says enough, which is great, and I don't wanna teach it now because we're gonna teach what that is and what that means when we get to that in the text in a few weeks. And then there is a hexad, and you're like, how far is this gonna go? How, there's an infinite amount of numbers, Pastor. Uh, is there gonna be a million ad, a million train here in a second? Um, I have work tomorrow. Um, this is the last one. Also from Proverbs 30, there are three things that are stately in their stride, four that move with stately bearing, a lion, mighty among beasts who retreats before nothing, a strutting rooster, a he-goat, and a king with his army around him. I love content like this because it is incredibly weird and I love weird content in the Bible because I find that oftentimes the fact that it's weird means it hasn't been studied as much and there's a lot of really fresh, cool, interesting things in it. And so we're gonna be looking at that just like we looked at the night where we talked about ants, Proverbs 6. Who is here for that? I love, I love a good ant commentary. Um, so that is those different types of patterns that you see in the text. I hope that little thing will just stick in your mind and I hope that that will help you 
as you read and study the book of Proverbs. Now we're going to look at top 10. Here we go. Top 10. Who's ready for it? We're going to count them down. We're going to count them down David Letterman style. But unlike David Letterman, I actually am happy that I'm here. (laughs) Coming in. Coming in at number 10. Proverbs 18.22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. This is key. This is important content. The New Testament has a lot of content about the benefits of singleness because Paul was single. And uh, some Christians take the New Testament as more significant than the Old Testament and try to build a case out for that. It's not the truth. It's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is merely coloring in whatever the Bible wants to color in because that's the way the Holy Spirit inspired it. And the true teaching of the Bible is that being married is a good thing. It's good to want to be married. It's good to seek to be married. It's good to have a desire sexually. It's good to have a desire for the opposite gender sexually. And it's good to hold on to that and wait to uh, use that in God's time, in God's way with the person that he has for you. That's the truth. Then there are people who are single, and praise God for those people, and some of them do substantially more ministry than anyone else, but that's a rarity. That's not the general call for most Christians. Here we see that idea in full, just as it is in Genesis 1 and 2. He who finds a wife finds a good thing, absolutely, and obtains favor from the Lord. It is a good thing, men, to look at your wife and to think, I have been favored by God to have this person. The ideas of the enemy would be the exact opposite of that. I wish I picked someone different. I wish they looked different. I wish they treated me different. I wish they talked different. I wish they made more money. I wish they were home more, whatever is the thing. All of those things are potentially valid to some extent, but they're not good things to meditate on and ruminate on. Those are doorways for the enemy to wreck your marriage. Instead, focus on what the truth of Scripture says, which is that if you're married, you have obtained favor from the Lord. What I am not meaning to imply is that if you are not married, you are not favored by the Lord. That isn't what I mean. That isn't what the Bible's teaching. In fact, singleness is good if that's what God has for you, and waiting for your partner is good if that's what God has for you. And if you're waiting, and this is a frustrating verse to you, I'm genuinely very sorry about that. Continue to wait and pray to the Lord, and if that is something God has for you, which I'm sure that it is because it is for almost all people, he will provide that in his time. Dwayne Garrett said in his commentary, this verse is an inclusio with chapter 19, verse 13 and 14, which we're going to be talking about in a minute. He also said that happiness is impossible without domestic tranquility, and the wife is the anchor of that tranquility. And that's true. And as much as the world wants to act like men and women are the same, they're not. And as much as the world wants to act like men and women need to be equal in outcome, they do not. They are equal before God, but they are not the same. And I hope that you understand that. That's extremely important. That's the way that God made it. Um, Coming in at number nine. Ready for this one? This is a good one. I'm sarcastic, so it's verses like these that help me go to sleep at night. (laughs) Did you read it already? Do you want me to read it to you? It's so good. This is such a good piece of content. In addition to being true, it is hilarious. It's better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Um, I would imagine that there's been at least one violent woman-on-man assault after a man quoted this verse in a fight to his wife. Christian men are not good at knowing which verses to invoke while they're in a fight. I'll just give you a hint. If you're using the word submit when your wife is angry, you're losing. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. Um, (laughs) Babe, I'm opening to the works of Paul. You better calm down. Um, (laughs) It is better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. This is funny, but it's also true. It is true that living with a person who fights It is better to have an extremely small amount of space and have that space completely to yourself. The idea here with the rooftop thing is that there is a roof that you can actually walk on. So it's not probably like our roofs of our houses, but picture like a flat house that 
there's like a deck on the top of the house and you just get one corner of that space. That's, that's the general idea of what they're going for. And um, that is true. Fighting is awful and it wrecks things. Lindsay Wilson said, these better than sayings about a quarrelsome wife are often referred to flippantly, but they do have a serious point to make. Discord is not only sown by the largely male characters mentioned in the surrounding verses, but also by members of either sex, and especially in the context of family life. Like the wider community, the home is intended as a place of peace. And his is a good point. His is a point that, yes, this is a verse specifically about a fighting wife. But if you read the entire chapter, there are things that both men and women do. And the idea of the Proverbs is not, oh, this is only a thing that wives do to husbands and the husbands never do it to the wives. It's just giving an example of something that happens. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I got another quote here. So it preserves the choice between ignominious solitude and intolerable society. Um, Bible commentaries are not funny, typically, and I find that phrase from Derek Kidner very funny. Listen to it again. It sounds like a guy who's trying to give feedback to his wife, knows that he can't, and thinks that if he uses big words, she won't understand that he's criticizing her. So, I'm being serious. It's funny. So it preserves the choice between ignominious solitude and intolerable society. Yes, it does. Coming in at number eight, 2710. Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. Do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. Now, we remember this is a, a quatrain, right? So we got that. That's cool. Um, this is an interesting proverb. The reason that I chose it is because I've never heard anyone talk about it ever for one second. And also I think it has kind of a complicated idea that when you read the text closely is very simple. So who feels a bit confused by this proverb right now upon reading it? Who's lying about the previous thing I asked? Okay, well, at least you confessed. Um, <laughs> Uh, don't forsake your friend and your father's friend. The first thing I like about this is the idea of intergenerational relationships. Do not forsake your father's friend. Um, intergenerational relationships are really good. In fact, from a study I read, the number one reason that teenagers stay in a church into adulthood is if they have intergenerational relationships which is one of the reasons why in every youth ministry I've ever led, we have attempted to recruit people of 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s to disciple the teenagers because people need that. They need to be a part of an intergenerational community. They need to be friends with their family members' friends and in the family house of God, we need to be friends with people that are of different ages than us. It is a good and solid thing. Now to the confusing part. Don't go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Just don't go. Why? Why would you not go to your brother's house? Is your brother a bad guy? Is he bad? Is he not good at listening? No, it's because the brother lives far away. And we see that here in the response portion of the text. Better is a neighbor who's near than a brother who is far away. So obviously it's the same verse, although the verses are not inspired. It's the same idea. It's the same paragraph. And it's talking about the idea that a brother lives far away. And if you were in a great traumatic experience, if you were getting divorced and you were incredibly emotionally hurt, the proverb is saying that it would be better for you to have a neighbor who is your friend who you trust than the only person that you could talk to be your brother who lives in Idaho. Does that make sense? That's the idea. Um, you're like, but I can call and text him now. Solomon never could have known about this. Um, <laughs> This verse could be paraphrased, George Schwab said. Don't forsake your nearby neighbors and friends of the family in their distress. When you are in distress, don't leave town to seek your distant kin. Your nearby friends are in a better position to help. Uh, George Schwab also points to an additional paraphrase from a theologian named McCain, who paraphrased, don't abuse your brother's solicitude for you. A solicitude which can take 
which you can take for granted because of the strength of family solidarity. Don't make it a practice of paying him a visit only when you have a hard luck story to tell him. I just can't go to this church cornerstone anymore. Pastor's reading paraphrases in his sermon now. Hmm. What's next? Is he going to preach from the message? Coming in at number seven. It's the grandparents' one. Proverbs 17, 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. It's a beautiful family proverb. Jesus teaches some very intense things about family, and it's important to note that those things are not um, at odds with the teaching of the Old Testament. They can be synthesized rather easily. This one says that grandchildren are the crown of the aged, and the glory of children is their fathers. This is true. Uh, Parents who do a good job raising their kids and then watch their kids raise kids, it is Uh, their glory. It is their crown. That is true. That is accurate. And that is a beautiful picture of multi-generational ministry, which is a big facet of the book of Proverbs. We studied at length chapters one through nine that repeatedly talked about this idea. This is a picture of my grandma. We called her Nan. I'm wearing a suit because we had to to church when I was growing up. Just kidding, I think I was going to like a school dance or something. I really wanted my hair to look like one of the guys in the band, The Strokes. Do you think I did a good job? That was the goal, 2006. This is a picture of my mom with her grandson, which is my son, Ezra. And my kids have started asking if they can text emojis, which they call mojis to their family members because they like are learning how to write and all that jazz, but they can't do it yet. And so they text emojis to people and then I write from Ezra so they don't, my family doesn't think that I'm on drugs. And <laughs> my mom sent back a picture. I love you, Ezra. Here's me and you. I thought that was beautiful. The Bible is saying that when you do a good job of loving and raising your kids, your grandkids are a massive blessing to you. And this is going to sound like a joke, but I don't mean it as a joke. And it's not just because you don't have to raise them because you already did that. It's because they are a massive blessing to you because you are multiplying out your faithfulness and righteousness across multiple generations. Just listening to a sermon um, from a guy named Derek Prince, who's one of the most amazing deliverance pastors teaching on the demonic realm ever. And he said in his sermon that his family was 110 people. He was, he was like 80 when he gave the sermon. And his kids and his grandkids and his great-grandkids were so numerous. And it just you could hear it in his voice how blessed he felt that all of these people had come out of this love that he had with his wife. That's what the proverb is going for. Um, coming in at number six, we're at the discipline ones now. Are you guys ready for those? Okay. Are you sure? can't go to this church anymore. Pastor talked about spanking. (laughs) Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. This verse was on a 10-foot wide, 3-foot high sign in front of my Christian grade school. (laughs) Um... Every day when I drove to school, it said this verse, but it said it in King James Version. So, you know, it's like, train up thy child in thy way, thou should thee, whatever. And uh, (laughs) I read this verse a lot of times when I was a kid. It's a beautiful verse. There's been a lot of blogs and think pieces about what the Hebrew actually means. Don't get in the mix on that stuff. People in 2022 are not smarter than all of the people who've studied the Bible for all of history. It's just not accurate. So when someone's trying to get in the mix and be like, it doesn't actually mean that. They're wrong. Um, That's not true. I'm not saying there aren't small problems with translations. There are, uh, but they're small. And also English hasn't been around for that long. They're working out a temporal multi-century problem. What they're going for is, oh, this, this doesn't mean what it has always meant to all Christians. You understand that that's ridiculous, right? 
Okay, good. That's important. It's important to understand as a Christian that you aren't smarter than all of the dead Christians. Does that make sense? Like all of the dead Christians are smarter than us. They didn't have, they didn't have cell phones and Netflix. They like looked at their family in the face from 6 to 10 p.m. They didn't look at screens with pictures of other people's families and then think that they were sad like we do every night when we go home until when we go to bed. <laughs> I got to stick to my notes. <laughs> so I get my I can feel it, because I'm coming to the spanking one. I can feel it. I'm gonna, I, I gotta not get myself in trouble. Train up a child in the way that he should go. This is a beautiful picture. Now remember, Proverbs are what? Principles, they are not what? Promises, that's important, that's true. This is not a promise. The Bible is not saying that if you do a good job parenting your kids, all of your kids are gonna be just like you and love God or whatever. That isn't what the Bible teaches, that isn't accurate. And that type of literalism has really hurt and wounded a lot of wonderful people whose children chose to walk away from the Lord for a time or permanently or whatever. I'd never speak that over anyone, but that's not true. That's not what the Bible is teaching. What it is teaching is something beautiful, which is when you are training up your child, when you are teaching your child uh, at a young age, at, at, when you're teaching them when they're a teenager, when you're teaching them as you can after they're a teenager, as they allow it, um, you are doing something that has a permanent value on their life. And it's extremely easy as a parent to think today doesn't matter. It was 8.30 last night and I was finishing up my taxes and I hadn't finished up this content. And my son was very frustrating to me because he would not go to bed. And my wife was a good parent and chose to go lay with him in bed and talk to him about his feelings while I was like muttering under my breath working on my taxes. And she understood in that moment this verse, which is those little moments matter, and you are doing something that is going to last for your kid's entire life. Don't be like me, is the moral of the story. Coming in at number five, 2917, discipline your son, and he'll give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. Beautiful picture, beautiful idea, very true. Disciplining your kids has value. People that don't discipline their kids when they're little are ashamed of their kids when they're older. That's almost always true. People that don't discipline their kids, people that don't put limits on their kids uh, are almost always ashamed of them when they're older. And you might be like, well, pastor, your kids are six years old and under. Yes, but I've worked with teenagers for 16 years. I've seen it all. I've seen every family. I've seen the good ones and I've seen many, many, many bad ones because the bad ones tend to ask for help a lot more often and you get a lot closer up look on those ones. I haven't gotten a lot of close up looks on a lot of really good families, but I've seen it and it's true. Discipline your kids in a good way, in a healthy way. Don't be rude to them. Don't, don't discipline them out of anger. Discipline them in righteousness and they will bring things back upon you that will be good for you. He will give you rest. When you raise your son correctly, it's saying, your son will bring rest to you. You will do him good and he will do you good. He will give delight to your heart. He will give delight to your emotions. Coming in at number four. Oh, here it is. Oh no. Can't believe all these Christians spanking their kids. Let's cancel all of them. <laughs> Terrible, every single one of them. I didn't even name my son. He's gonna pick his own name. <laughs> He's gonna pick his gender. He's gonna pick his name. He's gonna pick my name. I changed my name to nothing. He's gonna tell me what gender I am. Kids are so innocent and smart. They know everything. Um, <laughs> so the word rod here in Hebrew is, uh, means, it, it means a device to uh, teach your children through spanking. It's not violence. It's not talking about violence. It's not talking about leaving a mark. It's not talking about hurting anyone. It's not talking about hitting people in anger. And anyone who says that they have a problem with that probably didn't have a problem with Will Smith slapping Chris Rock in the face. So, you know, 
what is happening here and what I believe it is teaching is for people that, all joking aside, for children who are too young to understand words, small, light uses of force teach them things that you cannot teach them with words in order to help keep them safe. For example, we all cook on hot stoves. We all use things around the house that are dangerous. Children have forks in their hands, and God forbid they would ever put one near a light socket. And if anything like that does happen, the most loving thing to do in that situation is to correctly correct them and teach them not to do that thing. That's what the Bible's talking about. It's not talking about using like a large wooden mallet and spanking your 16-year-old when he says the F word. That's not, what is, that's not what is being discussed. If anybody wants to mock that, I'm about that. Let's mock that together. That's ridiculous. That's not what is being said here. Also, the Proverbs is, is not always talking specifically about what it's talking about. It's surfacing an idea and teaching us. It's saying discipline. It's saying a specific type of discipline, but it's saying whoever does not discipline his son hates him. And that's true. God disciplines his kids, and God says that he disciplines us because he loves us. In fact, I've been working on my own heart as I've received discipline from the Lord to teach myself I believe that this is a mark of love from God. I don't have to like it. I don't have to act like I want more of it, but I can receive it from him in the way that he says that he's giving it. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline his son. That's true. People who let their kids run around, do whatever they want, and say whatever they want, they do not love their kids. They love themselves. Parents who do that are doing what is easiest for themselves. It's easiest for them to avoid conflict, and you are going to reap what you sow. And I hope that no one here does that. I'm sure that you don't. Coming in at number three. Oop. Thought it couldn't even get more intense than the last one, huh? Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. It's just, it's so intense that it's like, I can't believe that that is in the Bible. But it's good that that is in the Bible, because the Bible understands that anger in your heart is leading towards murder. We don't usually think of it like that, because we live like a civilized society. It's not like people on nationally televised events ever like physically assault each other. That would never happen in our like society that we live in. That being said, we tend to view ourselves as very far away from that. Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, you already have committed violence and murder towards them. That's what Jesus taught because he understands that that is the same thing further down the road. Does that make sense? So he's saying, here is an example of the very worst place it could possibly get. Discipline him now because there is hope. Don't let your anger run away with you. That's the idea. Coming in at number two, a foolish son is ruin to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, let us teach our sons to be wise, lest they bring shame upon us. And fighting, continual fighting, is like Chinese water torture. That's the idea. Um, Going to leave it at that. Coming in at number one, Proverbs 20, verse 7. Finish it on a positive note. You like that? Yeah. Come on. I'm like, nope, just kidding. Another spanking one. Um, <laughs> Proverbs 20, verse 7. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Every choice you make as a parent in righteousness is blessing generations after you. Your children are blessed when you behave in righteousness doesn't mean jamming it down your 18-year-old's throat who says he doesn't want to know God anymore. What it does mean is that when you choose to live righteously, you are having a generational impact. Do you understand that? I'm sure you do. Many of you are older than me and have more generations beneath you, and praise God for that. When you behave in righteousness, you are having a generational impact on your family. Almost every kid is trying to be exactly like their parents or the exact opposite of their parents. 
Let's give them reason to be like us and let's bless them with generations of righteousness and let's pray that God blesses us. George Schwab said precisely, quote, blessed are his sons after him, end quote. This man does, quote, walk in integrity, which is the counterpoint to 20 verse 6, which is the one before it. Do we have any questions? No, I didn't have time to make any memes. Sorry, I had to understand what a pentad was. <laughs> if you have a question in the room, go ahead and slip up your hand. I'm gonna pull up the YouTube on here. If you have a question on the internet, I hope you already typed it in. If you didn't, you can type it in now. We've got just a few minutes left. Does anyone have a question or anything that they would like to discuss? Oh, it's in the past. After him. Every choice you make as a parent. Wow. That's like a Christopher Nolan movie right there. Anybody? Can we have a week that's anywhere in between zero questions and 111 questions? That would be great. Let's just pick a lane. Let's do something in the middle. Why is that? I, I genuinely don't get it. It's like one week, everybody's like, no, I don't have a question, Pastor. I gotta go to bed. And then the next week, there's like a hundred really good questions in a row. And then people are lined up afterwards and they're like, help me understand this. And I want to so badly. We got one? One. Uh, yeah, just a very quick one. Well, how come he's only disciplining the sons? Um, um, he's not. He's not only disciplining his sons. He is teaching something using an example. Um, if I gave an example that was, if a man comes up to you and insults you, how should you behave? I don't mean you shouldn't do that if a woman comes up to you. I'm just giving an example. Does that make sense? And so he's teaching us in that way. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I hope that that helps. Thank you. Anybody else? We got one over here. What's a good way for just a believer in general to integrate reading of Proverbs into their Bible study, however they go about it during the week? Is there any examples that you could give that, that we could, you know, apply kind of what we're covering in the, you know, in this series? What a great question. Thank you for your question. Um, so did you say to, uh, to affect how do you integrate the book of Proverbs into your Bible study? Yeah, just, you know, obviously there's many different parts of the Bible to choose from, different types of sure. books. And, and so, you know, obviously Proverbs is different from other ones. So, yeah, kind of good examples of ways that we could apply it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, some of the read through the Bible in a year things do, you know, straight through the Old Testament, straight through the New Testament, and uh, some of Psalms and some of Proverbs. I think that that's great. I think that's a great way of doing it. Um, I think reading through Proverbs in a month, uh, 31, kind of works on that front. Um, I think that um, the way I have chosen to read it is I dig into it a lot. And then I just kind of have it in the mix for a few years and I don't study it, but that's generally how you study all the books in the Bible because you can't be reading all of them at the same time. I would say if you are a Christian and you are not on a trajectory to have studied through every book in the Bible in your lifetime, why would that be? And why would you not study all the books? And why do people who like Star Trek seem to like Star Trek more than we like the Bible? And why, why is that? I genuinely don't understand that. And so if you aren't studying and learning one book per year at least, you know, you're not gonna live 66 more years, probably almost anyone in the room. So that I think is something. And then in addition to that, um, more to your question, um, I believe that the books of wisdom and Proverbs specifically serves an incredible purpose of Giving one of the sides, this is, a bit, this, is, this is a bit heady, but I hope this will help you. Given one of the sides of the most intense versions of theological truth, and often in the New Testament and in the words of Christ, we get the other side. So in Christ we get, unless you hate your father and mother, you do not love me. And that's true. 
And there is no diminishment of that of any kind. And it's also true that we are to honor our father and mother, and those two things are not mutually exclusive. And so I would say, as you study seeking the whole counsel of God, seeking to understand all of the parts of the Bible, which is only tangentially related to your question, but I liked it so much, and I wanted to give it that full answer. I hope that that helps. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Why don't we spend some time in prayer? You guys, want, we got five minutes left. Do you want to just leave or you want to spend some time praying together? Let's pray. Well, you don't really have a choice in that, in that option, right? What are you going to say? No, I want to literally leave. I don't want to pray to the God that I'm here to worship. Um, let's pray together. Um, let's pray through some of these family ideas. We got five minutes. Why not? Let's just see how the Lord leads right now. Uh, God, we love you in this place. And so we're first going to pray about um, parents and families. And so we just want to pray, first of all, God, for people in the room who that's a bit of a rough topic because they had a bit of a rough go of it with their family getting raised. Would you restore things like that, God? Would you help us? Would you help us as things are generated in our minds and hearts that are ways that our parents didn't behave like that? And so our mind immediately goes to, well, I would be able to do blank if my parents did blank, but they didn't, and so I can't. Would you help us to see that uh, through Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can overcome and break any generational sin of any kind? We break, we do, we break generational curses in the name of Jesus. That's not a thing we can do, we do do that. Would you help people who are in that circumstance tonight, God? Would you bless their hearts? Um, would you help them, God? Um, and I want to pray for people who have regrets. If they are on their second or third marriage or one of their sons walked away from the Lord and so it's so hard to listen to the clear truth from Proverbs because it hurts that part of us that knows that we did it wrong. Would you help that person today, God? Would you bless them? Would you inspire them again to pray for their son or daughter to come home? Would you uh, give them the faith to believe? Whatever is the center of the mystery of you saying, believe it and you will receive it. We don't want to act like our words can make things happen because they can't, but we do want the full weight of whatever you meant about faith in that Jesus. We want to pray great prayers and see them answered. Would you help them, God? Would you help someone who has blown up a couple marriages and is now really trying to do it right? Would you help them tonight, God? Would you bless them? Would you um, help them to obey these things? Would you give them freedom from regret in the name of Jesus? Would you give them freedom from guilt and shame in the name of Jesus? Would you help them tonight, Father? And for people who are here who are single and are waiting, and so they might not have even come if they knew this is what we were talking about. Would you help that person tonight, God? Would you give them patience and faith? Would you give them faith to wait on what is your best? You said uh, that you know when a sparrow falls. So if you know that, you certainly know what's on their heart. Would you help them to believe by faith that you know and are willing to lean in and feel everything that they feel right now? Jesus, you cried when Lazarus died and you knew you were about to raise him from the dead. So if you knew that, God, and you're willing to feel that level of emotional pain for something you were about to fix. I believe that you feel the emotional pain of people who are single and waiting, especially single women who love you with all of their hearts and they cannot find a man who loves you even close to that much. And I, I don't mean that as a joke. That's so true and it happens all the time. Would you help that woman tonight, God? Would you bless their heart? Would you bless them as they wait and as they watch and as they hope? And so we're lifting up all of these things to you now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here tonight, guys. We'll see you next week.